Chapter One of He Can Who Thinks He Can. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. He Can Who Thinks He Can by Orison Sweat Marden. Chapter One He Can Who Thinks He Can. I promised my God I would do it. In September 1862, when Lincoln issued his preliminary emancipation proclamation, the sublimest act of the nineteenth century, he made this entry in his diary. I promised my God I would do it. Does anyone doubt that such a mighty resolution added power to this marvelous man, or that it nerved him to accomplish what he had undertaken? neither ridicule nor caricature neither dread of enemies nor desertion of friends could shake his indomitable faith in his ability to lead the nation through the greatest struggle in its history napoleon bismarck and all other great achievers had colossal faith in themselves it doubled trebled even quadrupled the ordinary power of these men in no other way can we account for the achievements of luther wesley or savonarola without this sublime faith this confidence in her mission how could the simple country maiden jean d'arc have led and controlled the french army this divine self-confidence multiplied her power a thousandfold until even the king obeyed her and she led his stalwart troops as if they were children after william pitt was dismissed from office he said to the duke of devonshire i'm sure i can save this country and that nobody else can for eleven weeks says bancroft england was without a minister at length the king and aristocracy recognized pitt's ascendancy and yielded to him the reins it was his unbounded confidence in his ability that compelled the recognition and led to the supremacy in england of benjamin disraeli the once despised jew he did not quail or lose heart when the hisses and jeers of the british parliament rang in his ears he sat down amid the jeering members saying you will yet hear me he felt within him the confidence of power that made him prime minister of england and turned sneers and hisses into admiration and applause much of president roosevelt's success has been due to his colossal self-confidence he believes in roosevelt as napoleon believed in napoleon there is nothing timid or half-hearted about our great president he goes at everything with gigantic assurance with that tremendous confidence which half wins the battle before he begins it's astonishing how the world makes way for a resolute soul and how obstacles get out of the path of a determined man who believes in himself there is no philosophy by which a man can do a thing when he thinks he can't what can defeat a strong man who believes in himself and cannot be ridiculed down talked down or written down poverty cannot dishearten him misfortune deter him or hardship turn him a hair's breadth from his course whatever comes he keeps his eye on the goal and pushes ahead what would you think of a young man ambitious to become a lawyer who should surround himself with a medical atmosphere and spend his time reading medical books do you think he would ever become a great lawyer by following such a course no he must put himself in a law atmosphere go where he can to absorb it and be steeped in it until he is attuned to the legal note he must be so grafted upon the legal tree that he can feel its sap circulating through him. How long will it take a young man to become successful who puts himself in an atmosphere of failure and remains in it until he is soaked, saturated with the idea? How long will it take a man who depreciates himself, talks failure, thinks failure, walks like a failure and dresses like a failure, who is always complaining of the insurmountable difficulties in his way, and whose every step is on the road to failure how long will it take him to arrive at the success goal will anyone believe him or expect him to win the majority of failures begin to deteriorate by doubting or depreciating themselves or by losing confidence in their own ability the moment you harbor doubt and begin to lose faith in yourself you capitulate to the enemy every time you acknowledge weakness inefficiency or lack of ability you weaken your self-confidence, and that is to undermine the very foundation of all achievement. So long as you carry around a failure atmosphere and radiate doubt and discouragement, you will be a failure. Turn about face, cut off all currents of failure thoughts, of discouraged thoughts. 
boldly face your goal with a stout heart and a determined endeavor and you will find that things will change for you but you must see a new world before you can live in it it is to what you see to what you believe to what you struggle incessantly to attain that you will approximate trust thyself every heart vibrates to that iron string i know people who have been hunting for months for a situation because they go into an office with the confession of weakness in their very manner they show their lack of self-confidence their prophecy of failure is in their face in their bearing they surrender before the battle begins they are living witnesses against themselves when you ask a man to give you a position and he reads this language in your face and manner please give me a position do not kick me out fate is against me i am an unlucky dog i am disheartened i have lost confidence in myself he will only have contempt for you he will say to himself that you are not a man to start with and he will get rid of you as soon as he can if you expect to get a position you must go into an office with the air of a conqueror you must fling out self-confidence from yourself before you can convince an employer that you are the man he's looking for you must show by your very presence that you are a man of force a man who can do things with vigor cheerfulness and enthusiasm self-reliance which carries great vigorous self-faith has ever been the best substitute for friends pedigree influence and money it is the best capital in the world it has mastered more obstacles overcome more difficulties and carried through more enterprises than any other human quality i have interviewed many timid people as to why they let opportunities pass by them that were eagerly seized by others with much less ability and the answer was invariably a confession like the following i have not the courage said one i lack confidence in myself said another i shrink from trying for fear i shall make a mistake and i shall have the mortification of being turned down said a third it would look so cheeky for me to have the nerve to put myself forward said a fourth oh i do not think it would be right to seek a place so far above me said another i think i ought to wait until the place seeks me or i am better prepared so they run through the whole gamut of self-distrust this shrinking this timidity or self-effacement often proves a worse enemy to success than actual incompetence take the lantern in hand and you will always have light enough for your next step no matter how dark for the light will move along with you do not try to see the long way ahead one step is enough for me a physical trainer in one of our girls colleges says that his first step is to establish the girls in self-confidence to lead them to think only of the ends to be attained and not of the means he shows them that the greater power lies behind the muscles in the mind and points to the fact so frequently demonstrated that a person in a supreme crisis as in a fire or other catastrophe can exert strength out of all proportion to his muscle he thus helps them get rid of fear and timidity the great handicaps to achievement i believe if we had a larger conception of our possibilities a larger faith in ourselves we could accomplish infinitely more and if we only better understood our divinity we would have this larger faith we are crippled by the old orthodox idea of man's inferiority there is no inferiority about the man that god made the only inferiority in us is what we put into ourselves what god made is perfect the trouble is that most of us are but a burlesque of the man god patterned and intended a harvard graduate who has been out of college a number of years writes that because of his lack of self-confidence he has never earned more than twelve dollars a week a graduate of princeton tells us that except for a brief period he has never been able to earn more than a dollar a day these men do not dare to assume responsibility their timidity and want of faith in themselves destroy their efficiency the great trouble with many of us is that we do not believe enough in ourselves we do not realize our power man was made to hold up his head and carry himself like a conqueror not like a slave as a success not as a failure to assert his god-given birthright self-depreciation is a crime if you would be superior you must hold the thought of superiority constantly in the mind 
a singularly modest man of so retiring a disposition that at one time he did not show half of his great ability whose shrinking nature and real talent for self-abasement had actually given him an inferior appearance told me one day how he had encountered this tendency toward self-depreciation among other things he said he had derived a great benefit from the practice he had formed of going about the streets especially where he was not known with an air of great importance as though imagining himself the mayor of the city the governor of the state or even president of the united states by merely looking as though he expected everybody to recognize that he must be a person of note he changed not only his appearance but also his convictions it raised him immeasurably in his own estimation it had a marked effect upon his whole character where once he walked through the streets shrinking from the gaze of others and dreading their scrutiny he now boldly invites even demands attention by his evident superiority for he has the appearance of one whom people would like to know in other words he has caught a glimpse of his divinity he really feels his superiority and his self-respecting manner reflects it be sure that your success will never rise higher than your confidence in yourself the greatest artist in the world could not paint the face of a madonna with a model of depravity in his mind you cannot succeed while doubting yourself or thinking thoughts of failure cling to success thoughts fill your mind with cheerful optimistic pictures pictures of achievement this will scatter the specters of doubt and fear and send a power through you which will transform you into an achiever no matter how poor or how hemmed in you may be stoutly deny the power of adversity or poverty to keep you down constantly assert your superiority to environment believe in yourself feel that you are to dominate your surroundings resolve that you will be the master and not the slave of circumstances this very assertion of superiority this assumption of power this affirmation of your ability to succeed the attitude that claims success is an inalienable birthright will strengthen the whole man and give great added power to the combination of faculties which doubt fear and lack of confidence undermine self-confidence marshals all one's faculties and twists their united strength into one mighty achievement cable it carries conviction it makes other people believe in us what has not been accomplished through its miraculous power what triumphs in invention in art and in discovery have been wrought through its magic what does not civilization owe to the invincible self-faith of its inventors its discoverers its railroad builders its mind developers and city builders it has won a thousand victories in science and in war which were deemed impossible by faint-hearted doubters the fact that you believe implicitly that you can do what may seem impossible or very difficult to others shows that there is something within you that has gotten a glimpse of power sufficient to do the thing many men who have achieved great things cannot account for their faith they cannot tell why they had the implicit confidence that they could do what they undertook but the result was evidence that something within them had gotten a glimpse of latent resourceful reserve power and possibilities which would warrant that faith and they have gone ahead often when they could not see a ray of light with implicit confidence that they would come out all right because this faith told them so it told them so because it had been in communication with something within them that was divine that which had passed the bounds of unlimited and entered the domain of the limitless when we begin to exercise the faculties of self-faith self-confidence we are stimulating and increasing the strength of the very faculties which enable us to do the thing we have set our hearts on the very exercise of faith helps us to do what we undertake because our greater concentration develops that portion of the brain which enables us to accomplish it men who have left their mark on the world have often been implicit followers of their faith when they could see no light and their faith has led them through the wilderness of doubt and hardship into the promised land our faith often tells us that we may proceed safely even in the dark when we see no light ahead faith is a divine leader which never misdirects us we must only be sure that it is faith and not merely egotism or selfish desire our faith puts us in touch with the infinite opens the way to unbound possibilities limitless power 
it is the truth of our being it is the one thing that we can be sure will not mislead us an unwavering belief in oneself destroys the greatest enemies of achievement fear doubt and vacillation it removes the thousand and one obstacles which impede the progress of the weak and irresolute faith in one's mission in the conviction that the creator has given us power to realize our life call as it is written in our blood and stamped on our brain cells is the secret of all power poverty and failure are self-invited the disasters people dread often come to them worry and anxiety enfeeble their force of mind and so blunt their creative and productive faculties that they are unable to exercise them properly fear of failure or lack of faith in one's ability is one of the most potent causes of failure many people of splendid powers have attained only mediocre success and some are total failures because they set bounds to their achievement beyond which they did not allow themselves to think that they could pass they put limitations to their ability they cast stumbling blocks in their way by aiming only at mediocrity or predicting failure for themselves taking their wares down instead of up disparaging their business and belittling their powers thoughts are forces and the constant affirmation of one's inherent right and power to succeed will change inhospitable conditions and unkind environments to favorable ones if you resolve upon success with energy you will very soon create a success atmosphere and things will come your way you can make yourself a success magnet if things would only change you cry what is it that changes things wishing or hustling dreaming or working can you expect them to change while you merely sit down and wish them to change how long would it take you to build a house sitting on the foundation and wishing that it would go up wishing does not amount to anything unless it is backed by endeavor determination and grit webster's father was much chagrined and pained when daniel refused a fifteen hundred dollars clerkship in the court of common pleas in new hampshire which he had worked hard to secure for him after he left college daniel he said don't you mean to take that office no indeed father i hope i can do much better than that i mean to use my tongue in the courts not my pen i mean to be an actor not a register of other men's acts sublime self-faith was characteristic of this giant's career every child should be taught to expect success and to believe that he was born to achieve as the acorn is destined to become an oak it is cruel for parents and teachers to tell children that they are dull or stupid or that they are not like others of their age they should inspire them instead with hope and confidence and belief in their success birthright a child should be trained to expect great things and should believe firmly in his god-given power to accomplish something worth while in the world without self-faith and an iron will man is but the plaything of chance a puppet of circumstances with these he is a king and it is in childhood the seeds must be sown that will make him a conqueror in life if you want to reach nobility you can never do it by holding the thought of inferiority the thought that you are not as good as other people that you are not as able that you cannot do this that you cannot do that can't philosophy never does anything but tear down it never builds up if you want to amount to anything in the world you must hold up your head say to yourself continually i am no beggar i am no pauper i'm not a failure i am a prince i am a king success is my birthright and nobody shall deprive me of it a proper self-esteem is not a vulgar quality it is a very sacred one to esteem oneself justly is to get a glimpse of the infinite's plan in us it is to get the perfect image which the creator had in mind when he formed us the complete man or woman not the dwarf pinched one with lack of self-esteem or of self-confidence sees when we get a glimpse of our immortal selves we shall see possibilities of which we never before dreamed a sense of wholeness of power and self-confidence will come into our lives which will transform them when we rate ourselves properly we shall be in tune with the infinite our faculties will be connected with an electric wire which carries unlimited power and we shall no longer stumble in darkness doubt and weakness we shall be invincible end of chapter one
Chapter Two of He Can Who Thinks He Can by Orison Sweat Marden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Getting Aroused. How's the boy getting on, Davis? asked Farmer John Field as he watched his son, Marshall, waiting upon a customer. Well, John, you and I are old friends, replied Deacon Davis as he took an apple from a barrel and handed it to Marshall's father as a peace offering. We're old friends, and I don't want to hurt your feelings. But I'm a blunt man, and air going to tell you the truth. Marshall is a good steady boy, all right, but he wouldn't make a merchant if he stayed in my store a thousand years. He weren't cut out for a merchant. Take him back to the farm, John, and teach him how to milk cows. If Marshall Field had remained as clerk in Deacon Davis's store in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where he got his first position, he could never have become one of the world's merchant princes. But when he went to Chicago and saw the marvelous examples around him of poor boys who had won success, it aroused his ambition and fired him with the determination to be a great merchant himself. If others can do such wonderful things, he asked himself, why cannot I? Of course, there was the making of a great merchant in Mr. Field from the start, but circumstances and ambition arousing environment had a great deal to do with stimulating his latent energy and bringing out his reserve force. It is doubtful if he would have climbed so rapidly in any other place than Chicago. In 1856, when young Field went there, this marvelous city was just starting on its unparalleled career. It had then only about 85,000 inhabitants. A few years before, it had been a mere Indian trading village. But the city grew by leaps and bounds, and always beat the predictions of its most sanguine inhabitants. Success was in the air. Everybody felt there were great possibilities there. Many people seem to think that ambition is a quality born within us, that is not susceptible to improvement, that it is something thrust upon us which will take care of itself. But it is a passion that responds very quickly to cultivation, and it requires constant care and education, just as the faculty for music or art does, or it will atrophy. If we do not try to realize our ambition, it will not keep sharp and defined. Our faculties become dull and soon lose their power if they are not exercised. How can we expect our ambition to remain fresh and vigorous through years of inactivity, indolence, or indifference? If we constantly allow opportunities to slip by us without making any attempt to grasp them, our inclination will grow duller and weaker. What I most need, as Emerson says, is somebody to make me do what I can. To do what I can, that is my problem not what a Napoleon or Lincoln could do, but what I can do. It makes all the difference in the world to me whether I bring out the best thing in me or the worst, whether I utilize ten, fifteen, twenty-five, or ninety percent of my ability. Everywhere we see people who have reached middle life or later without being aroused. They have developed only a small percentage of their success possibilities. They are still in a dormant state. The best thing in them lies so deep that it has never been awakened. When we meet these people, we feel conscious that they have a great deal of latent power that has never been exercised. Great possibilities of usefulness and of achievement are all unconsciously going to waste within them. Some time ago there appeared in the newspapers an account of a girl who had reached the age of fifteen years, and yet had only attained the mental development of a small child. Only a few things interested her. She was dreamy, inactive, and indifferent to everything around her most of the time, until one day, while listening to a hand organ on the street, she suddenly awakened to full consciousness. She came to herself. Her faculties were aroused. And in a few days she leaped forward years in her development. Almost in a day she passed from childhood to budding womanhood. Most of us have an enormous amount of power of latent force slumbering within us, as it slumbered in this girl, which could do marvels if we would only awaken it. The judge of the municipal court in a flourishing western city, one of the most highly esteemed jurists in his state, was in middle life before his latent power was aroused, an illiterate blacksmith. He is now sixty, the owner of the finest library in his city, with the reputation of being its best read man, and one whose highest endeavor is to help his fellow man. What caused the revolution in his life? 
the hearing of a single lecture on the value of education this was what stirred the slumbering power within him awakened his ambition and set his feet in the path of self-development i've known several men who never realized their possibilities until they reached middle life then they were suddenly aroused as if from a long sleep by reading some inspirating stimulating book by listening to a sermon or lecture or by meeting some friend someone with high ideals who understood believed in and encouraged them it will make all the difference in the world to you whether you are with people who are watching for ability in you people who believe in encourage and praise you or whether you are with those who are forever breaking your idols blasting your hopes and throwing cold water on your aspirations the chief probation officer of the children's court in new york in his report for nineteen o five says removing a boy or girl from improper environment is the first step in his or her reclamation the new york society for the prevention of cruelty to children after thirty years of investigation of cases involving the social and moral welfare of over half a million children has also come to the conclusion that environment is stronger than heredity even the strongest of us are not beyond the reach of our environment no matter how independent strong-willed and determined our nature we are constantly being modified by our surroundings take the best-born child with the greatest inherited advantages and let it be reared by savages and how many of its inherited tendencies will remain if brought up from infancy in a barbarous brutal atmosphere it will of course become brutal the story is told of a well-born child who being lost or abandoned as an infant was suckled by a wolf with her own young ones and who actually took on all the characteristics of the wolf walked on all fours howled like a wolf and ate like one it does not take much to determine the lives of most of us we naturally follow the example about us and as a rule we rise or fall according to the strongest current in which we live the poets i am a part of all that i have met is not a mere poetic flight of fancy it's an absolute truth everything every sermon or lecture or conversation you have heard every person who has touched your life has left an impress upon your character and you are never quite the same person after the association or experience you are a little different modified somewhat from what you were before just as beecher was never the same man after reading ruskin some years ago a party of russian workers were sent to this country by a russian firm of shipbuilders in order they might acquire american methods and catch the american spirit within six months the russians had become almost the equals of american artisans among whom they worked they had developed ambition individuality personal initiative and a marked degree of excellence in their work a year after their return to their own country the deadening non-progressive atmosphere about them had done its work the men had lost the desire to improve they were again plotters with no goal beyond the day's work the ambition aroused by stimulating environment had sunk to sleep again our indian schools sometimes publish side by side photographs of the indian youths as they come from the reservations and as they look when they are graduated well-dressed intelligent with the fire of ambition in their eyes we predict great things for them but the majority of those who go back to their tribes after struggling a while to keep up their new standards gradually drop back to their old manner of living there are of course many notable exceptions but these are strong characters able to resist the downward dragging tendencies about them if you interview the great army of failures you will find that multitudes have failed because they never got into a stimulating encouraging environment because their ambition was never aroused or because they were not strong enough to rally under depressing discouraging or vicious surroundings most of the people we find in prisons and poorhouses are pitiable examples of the influence of an environment which appealed to the worst instead of to the best in them whatever you do in life make any sacrifice necessary to keep an ambition arousing atmosphere an environment that will stimulate you to self-development keep close to people who understand you who believe in you who will help you to discover yourself and encourage you to make the most of yourself 
this may make all the difference to you between a grand success and a mediocre existence stick to those who are trying to do something and to be somebody in the world people of high aims lofty ambition keep close to those who are dead in earnest ambition is contagious you will catch the spirit that dominates your environment the success of those about you who are trying to climb upward will encourage and stimulate you to struggle harder if you have not done quite so well yourself there is a great power in a battery of individuals who are struggling for the achievement of high aims a great magnetic force which will help you to attract the object of your ambition it is very stimulating to be with people whose aspirations run parallel with your own if you lack energy if you are naturally lazy indolent or inclined to take it easy you will be urged forward by the constant prodding of the more ambitious end of chapter two chapter three of he can who thinks he can by orison sweat marden this librivox recording is in the public domain education by absorption john wanamaker was once asked to invest in an expedition to recover from the spanish main doubloons which for half a century had lain at the bottom of the sea in sunken frigates young men he replied i know of a better expedition than this right here near your own feet lie treasures untold you can have them all by faithful study let us not be content to mine the most coal to make the largest locomotives to weave the largest quantities of carpets but amid the sounds of the pick the blows of the hammer the rattle of the looms and the roar of the machinery take care that the immortal mechanism of god's own hand the mind is still full trained for the highest and noblest service the uneducated man is always placed at a great disadvantage no matter how much natural ability one may have if he's ignorant he is discounted it is not enough to possess ability it must be made available by mental discipline we ought to be ashamed to remain in ignorance in a land where the blind the deaf and dumb and even cripples and invalids manage to obtain a good education many youths throw away little opportunities for self-culture because they cannot see great ones they let the years slip by without any special effort at self-improvement until they are shocked in middle life or later by waking up to the fact that they are still ignorant of what they ought to know everywhere we go we see men and women especially from twenty-five to forty years of age who are cramped and seriously handicapped by the lack of early training i often get letters from such people asking if it's possible for them to educate themselves so late in life of course it is there are so many good correspondence schools today and institutions like chatoagua so many evening schools lectures books libraries and periodicals that men and women who are determined to improve themselves have abundant opportunities to do so while you lament the lack of early education and think it's too late to begin you may be sure that there are other young men and women not very far from you who are making great strides in self-improvement though they may not have half as good an opportunity for it as you have the first thing to do is to make a resolution strong vigorous and determined that you are going to be an educated man or woman that you are not going to go through life humiliated by ignorance that if you have been deprived of early advantages you are going to make up for their loss resolve that you will no longer be handicapped and placed at a disadvantage for that which you can remedy you will find the whole world will change to you when you change your attitude toward it you'll be surprised to see how quickly you can very materially improve your mind after you've made a vigorous resolve to do so go about it with the same determination that you would to make money or to learn a trade there is a divine hunger in every normal being for self-expansion a yearning for growth or enlargement beware of stifling this craving of nature for self-unfoldment man was made for growth it is the object the explanation of his being to have an ambition to grow larger and broader every day to push the horizon of ignorance a little farther away to become a little richer in knowledge a little wiser and more of a man that is an ambition worth while 
it is not absolutely necessary that an education should be crowded into a few years of school life the best educated people are those who are always learning always absorbing knowledge from every possible source and at every opportunity i know young people who have acquired a better education a finer culture through a habit of observation or of carrying a book in the pocket to read at odd moments or by taking courses in correspondence schools than many who have gone through college youths who are quick to catch at new ideas and who are in frequent contact with superior minds not only often acquire a personal charm but even to a remarkable degree develop mental power the world is a great university from the cradle to the grave we are always in god's great kindergarten where everything is trying to teach us its lesson to give us its great secret some people are always at school always storing up precious bits of knowledge everything has a lesson for them it all depends upon the eye that can see the mind that can appropriate very few people ever learn how to use their eyes they go through the world with a superficial glance at things their eye pictures are so faint and so dim that details are lost and no strong impression is made on the mind yet the eye was intended for a great educator the brain is a prisoner never getting out to the outside world it depends upon its five or six servants the senses to bring it material and the larger part of it comes through the eye the man who has learned the art of seeing things looks with his brain i know a father who is training his boy to develop his powers of observation he will send him out upon a street with which he is not familiar for a certain length of time and then question him on his return to see how many things he has observed he sends him to the show windows of great stores to museums and other public places to see how many of the objects he has seen the boy can recall and describe when he gets home the father says that this practice develops in the boy a habit of seeing things instead of merely looking at them when a new student went to the great naturalist professor agassiz of harvard he would give him a fish and tell him to look at it for half an hour or an hour and then describe to him what he saw after the student thought he had told everything about the fish the professor would say you have not really seen the fish yet look at it a while longer and then tell me what you see he would repeat this several times until the student developed a capacity for observation if we go through life like an interrogation point holding an alert inquiring mind toward everything we can acquire great mental wealth wisdom which is beyond all material riches ruskin's mind was enriched by the observation of birds insects beasts trees rivers mountains pictures of sunset and landscape and by memories of the song of the lark and of the brook his brain held thousands of pictures of paintings of architecture of sculpture a material wealth which he reproduced as a joy for all time everything gave up its lesson its secret to his inquiring mind the habit of absorbing information of all kinds from others is of untold value a man is weak and ineffective in proportion as he secludes himself from his kind there is a constant stream of power a current of forces running to and fro between individuals who have come in contact with one another if they have inquiring minds we are all giving and taking perpetually when we associate together the achiever today must keep in touch with the society around him he must put his finger on the pulse of the great busy world and feel its throbbing life he must be a part of it or there will be some lack in his life a single talent which one can use effectively is worth more than ten talents imprisoned by ignorance education means that knowledge has been assimilated and become a part of the person it is the ability to express the power within one to give out what one knows that measures efficiency and achievement pent up knowledge is useless people who feel their lack of education and who can afford the outlay can make wonderful strides in a year by putting themselves under good tutors who will direct their reading and study along different lines the danger of trying to educate oneself lies in delusory disconnected aimless studying which does not give anything like the benefit to be derived from the pursuit of a definite program for self-improvement 
a person who wishes to educate himself at home should get some competent well-trained person to lay out a plan for him which can only be effectively done when the adviser knows the vocation the tastes and the needs of the would-be student any one who aspires to an education whether in country or city can find someone to at least guide his studies some teacher clergyman lawyer or other educated person in the community to help him there is one special advantage in self-education you can adapt your studies to your own particular needs better than you could in school or college everyone who reaches middle life without an education should first read and study along the line of his own vocation and then broaden himself as much as possible by reading on other lines one can take up alone many studies such as history english literature rhetoric drawing mathematics and can also acquire by oneself almost as effectively as with a teacher a reading knowledge of foreign languages the daily storing up of valuable information for use later in life the reading of books that will inspire and stimulate to greater endeavor the constant effort to try to improve oneself and one's condition in the world are worth far more than a bank account to a youth how many girls there are in this country who feel crippled by the fact that they have not been able to go to college and yet they have the time and the material close at hand for obtaining a splendid education but they waste their talents and opportunities in frivolous amusements and things which do not count in forceful character building it is not such a very great undertaking to get all the essentials of a college course at home or at least a fair substitute for it every hour in which one focuses his mind vigorously upon his studies at home may be as beneficial as the same time spent in college every well-ordered household ought to protect the time of those who desire to study at home at a fixed hour every evening during the long winter there should be by common consent a quiet period for mental concentration for what is worth while in mental discipline a quiet hour uninterrupted by time thief callers in thousands of homes where the members are devoted to each other and should encourage and help each other along it is made almost impossible for anyone to take up reading studying or any exercise for self-improvement perhaps someone is thoughtless and keeps interrupting the others so that they cannot concentrate their minds or those who have nothing in common with your aims or your earnest life drop in to spend an evening in idle chatter they have no ideals outside of the bread and butter and amusement questions and do not realize how they are hindering you there is constant temptation to waste one's evenings and it takes a stout ambition and a firm resolution to separate oneself from a jolly fun-living and congenial family circle or happy-hearted youthful callers in order to try to rise above the common herd of unambitious persons who are content to slide along totally ignorant of everything but the requirements of their particular vocations a habit of forcing yourself to fix your mind steadfastly and systematically upon certain studies even if only for periods of a few minutes at a time is of itself of the greatest value this habit helps one to utilize the odds and ends of time which are unavailable to most people because they have never been trained to concentrate the mind at regular intervals a good understanding of the possibilities that live in spare moments is a great success asset the very reputation of always trying to improve yourself of seizing every opportunity to fit yourself for something better the reputation of being dead in earnest determined to be somebody and to do something in the world would be of untold assistance to you people like to help those who are trying to help themselves they will throw opportunities in their way such a reputation is the best kind of capital to start with one trouble with people who are smarting under the consciousness of deficient education is that they do not realize the immense value of utilizing spare minutes like many boys who will not save their pennies and small change because they cannot see how a fortune could ever grow by the saving they cannot see how a little study here and there each day will ever amount to a good substitute for a college education i know a young man who never attended a high school and yet educated himself so superbly that he has been offered a professorship in a college 
most of his knowledge was gained during his odds and ends of time while working hard at his vocation spare time meant something to him the correspondence schools deserve very great credit for inducing hundreds of thousands of people including clerks mill operatives and employees of all kinds to take their courses and thus save for study the odds and ends of time which otherwise would probably be thrown away we have heard of some most remarkable instances of rapid advancement which these correspondence school students have made by reason of the improvement in their education many students have reaped a thousand percent on their educational investment it has saved them years of drudgery and has shortened wonderfully the road to their goal wisdom will not open her doors to those who are not willing to pay the price in self-sacrifice in hard work 